one of the things that has really emerged with the hemospray technology is uh, is its role in cancer related bleeding now um, you know good as we are with peptic ulcer disease bleeding in the last five decades four decades with a lot of data uh, and now with the emergence of novel technologies such as hemospray, cancer-related bleeding, uh, Rehan, has always been uh, a kind of the Achilles heel of the endoluminal endoscopist. You know, we, we've been able to throw covered stents for esophageal cancer bleeding and, you know, do a little bit of APC here and, and the patient's back the next day. But this has been a real game changer here, I think. So uh, any thoughts on what your experience has been, both anecdotally in the data, clinical experience, uh, if you can shed some light um, you know, on, on cancer bleeding uh, outcomes in, in your cohort, please. Yeah, listen, th this is a, a, a Mo is just uh, finalizing, or I think you've just submitted Mo uh, uh, the, the hemostasis abstract, which has now got, uh, you know, uh, three figures of patients. Now, these are, Vivek, these are a poorly served population. Uh, we all have them. Um, and, you know, historically, we, we have not really served these patients well because we've not really had the... Uh, the, 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 the stuff on the shelf that can really address their bleeding because these are not patients that present with hemodynamic instability or, or, or large volume hematemesis or hypotension. These patients are already significantly comorbid and burdened by their primary cancer and they will present with slow anemia and slow ooze and you know these are diffused cancers there was someone just showed a video a few moments ago where you cannot clip it we know that laser or apc is actually fairly uh fairly homeopathic and the outcomes here are not hemostasis the outcomes here are the impact on transfusion requirements like you alluded to earlier and and uh that slide that was up in most most recent data show that in patients presenting with anemia and bleeding secondary to upper GI cancers, that the application of hemospray actually reduces transfusion requirements when you compare the time before and the time after. And, and I really think that is a, um, you know, that's a telling, telling finding because um, these patients are often under the care of our oncology colleagues. They will not be candidates for radiotherapy. And and we need to get the word out now that we can actually, you know, we can uh, we can certainly stem these transfusion requirements with a very very easy intervention that then allows the patient either to go on to have curative surgery or indeed radiotherapy to 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 control the bleeding uh, more definitively. So I have to say this was one of Mo's, you know, more exciting papers, and I hope this will have a uh, you know a clinical impact on how we treat this cohort of patients. Yeah, I think as the video uh, was pretty self-explanatory, these are, uh, you know, the, the uh, these are difficult cases. But when we haven't had traditionally too many, uh, too many solutions for this uh, for this population, and uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you know the, the goals for care for the cancer patient, especially those that are advanced and aren't lucky enough to go to surgery, are to a get them out of the hospital, get them to start eating and and you know spending time with their family, and then if they are up for chemotherapy or radiation, get them to those events. Um, bleeding in a cancer patient uh, puts them in the hospital and really uh, fights against all of those uh, all of those principles. So I think uh, that's another area that uh, is emerging as something that's uh, going to be very impactful for hemospray use. Uh, Mo, you have any other uh, thoughts to shed, uh, like to shed on the cancer-related aspect of uh, hemospray? Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like um, like uh, Rehan just mentioned, I think we're coming out with some quite exciting data, particularly from this cancer cohort. Um, so in terms of just raw figures, so we had about 105 patients with upper GI bleed secondary to malignancy. And we looked at the transfusion requirements at 21 day or three weeks before and three weeks after treatment with hemospray. And there was a statistically significant uh, reduction in transfusion requirements. And what we found was, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Cal, that just, um, and particularly coming onto the point of health economics in these scenarios, it minimizes hospital stay. Um, it has a particular improvement on quality of life in these patient cohorts. 
um, if they're being managed conservatively, for example, they're not coming in and out of uh, hospital for transfusion. Um, uh, they have a 90, uh, our call had a 96% hemostasis rate and a, re and a reasonable real bleed rate of 14% in addition to that, which meant that it provided an appropriate bridge towards definitive uh, chemo, um, um, radiotherapy or definitive uh, surgery. Um, so in terms of management, what we felt and, uh, you know, what will come out in the manuscript is that it, it's a, a very useful um, as a first line monotherapy, at least cohort of patients. And what happens is when hemospray is used in combination, the performance drops. The orribly picks up and your hemostasis drops. And that's probably due to a friable tumor surface being disrupted by injection therapy or clips. So in these scenarios, what the data shows is using hemospray as a monotherapy is best in these scenarios already. Right. I think that the points you made are really, really important is that in the cancer patient, um, if you poke at it uh, with, with needles and clips, it's only creating more foci for trauma and uh, yet another uh, yet another contact point for bleeding. So uh, I think this is uh, clearly, you know, we, we have had very minimal solutions for cancer bleeding, and I think this represents a, a major advance. Uh, obviously, in, in the beginning, we, we, were, uh, we were not sure, but I think with the case series that have been presented and the data that's out or already published, and your own experience with the registry, it, it's becoming clear. One of the things that uh, I, I will caution, uh, I guess, all of us and, and those who are watching is that whenever you, so the cancer is, is, is an area that's generally owned by the oncologists and the surgeons. And I think that whenever there's a new paradigm in, in cancer therapy that GI brings to the table, uh, an important aspect of that is to engage with the uh, your multidisciplinary colleagues in, in, in radiation and oncology and, and surgery and, and let them know that you have a modality for uh, a new modality for the care of their patients uh, and that and that they can call you and you can demonstrate um, some degree of facility and, and help for the patient. That, that's something that I found very useful, uh, especially for newer technology where uh, people may not be aware uh, of that.